Welcome again to CAR. My name is Garland Jones. I am a pediatric neuropsychologist here at CAR. I'm going to talk a little bit today about neuropsych services at CAR. And if it's okay for everyone, why don't we do this in an informal type manner? So as questions come up, feel free to shout them out. And I'll certainly be time at the end for questions if, if folks want to wait until the end as well. So we'll do it that way, I think we'll all be fine. So at the end of this, um, I, you will know who we are, what we do, why we get kids referred to us, and at the end I want to do a little brief case vignette that will um, highlight some of the um, specialty uh, difficulties that we run across in, in doing our work. Okay. So who we are. There are three full-time neuropsychologists on staff. Myself, Dr. Folsom, and Dr. Watka, who is the supervising psychologist. And we also have three clinical psychologists who do, I guess best described as more developmental type assessments. So they tend to see younger children, more nonverbal children. And um, Drs. Washington and Shepard are full time. Dr. Mostow works uh, two, about two days a week here and spends the rest of her time in a neuropsych clinic. Um, downtown seeing a different population of children, as does Dr. Barrio and one of the other um, psychologists. So five, in essence, five full-time assessment psychologists working here. And because we are a teaching institution, we have trainees, so we have postdocs and interns always on staff, and they will tend to be part of um, assessments being supervised by psychologists. And so as neuropsychologists, we are basically trained in uh, brain behavior relationships. So the relationship between how the brain works and the behavior that's observed. And so when we're doing an assessment, we are looking at that relationship to explain differences in behavior through by differences in the brain and vice versa. So brain differences explain that by the behavior that we observe essence of our training. And so our major tool is this thing called the neuropsych assessment, which is a structured, um, standardized approach to doing this evaluation. So although at times it can look willy-nilly, it is actually um, very structured and very standardized in the way we do this. And this brain behavior examination is as far as I know, you need to neuropsychologists. So we are the only ones who um, are trained in looking at that relationship in that way, uh, look, looking at behavior in terms of that relationship. And this has become increasingly important children with autism and with developmental disorders in general uh, because as time has gone on, we've come to understand and it's almost like a duh situation. We've come to understand that, that autism and many of these disorders are not just behavior disorders. They uh, are rooted in brain development, in atypical brain development, in neurological functioning, and these sorts of things. So there's a relationship that's becoming increasingly clear between the disorder that we're observing and the function and development of the brain. And we've also come to understand that there are overlapping neurological disorders that must be considered when we're trying to make a determination about what it is we're seeing when we observe behavior in a child. So things like ADHD often overlap with autism. Uh, there are other, we've come to understand that there are other neurological conditions that affect brain development as well, and so we need an understanding of those to understand, again, what we're looking at when we see a child particular behavior. And so the only way that I know to do this accurately and precisely is with a neuropsychosessor. And that is what we do. And so when we talk about neurodevelopmental disorders, as many of you know, we're talking about disorders that represent something that has gone, the trajectory of which has gone atypical from the very beginning. So neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, they're not acquired disorders, so you can't get autism by your child falling off a swing and bumping their head. 
It's not acquired in that sense. Something is atypical in the trajectory of that child's brain development from the very beginning. <clears throat> and again, we have started to identify neurological correlates to these disorders. So we've, we've um, evidence is growing to show, for example, that children with autism um, have increased brain volumes in the, in the cerebral hemispheres and in the cerebellum, uh, decreased corpus callosum. So we're identifying these underlying at neuroanatomical and neurofunctional uh, correlates associated with these disorders. That being said, we are not yet to the point where we have reliable markers, clinical markers, to be able to make the diagnosis. Meaning that autism or Down syndrome or any other kind of developmental disorder cannot be diagnosed by MRI. So you can't take a picture of the brain and say, oh, you see, so as you can with a brain injury or brain tumor or something like that. You still can't do it. So autism and um, many of the other um, development disorders, they are diagnosed by observation of behavior in no other way. And just real quickly, so again, for example, we have identified that there is increased brain volume in children with autism, and that has been, uh, for the most part, related to increased white matter rather than neurons, which is associated with a bunch of theories, we won't get too technical here, but a bunch of theories that have to do with cutting activity. So that there's some suggestion that something is going awry in terms of how the, the different parts of the brain are connected and transmitting information and that sort of thing. And through the work of Dr. Mafoski, who is medical director here, looking at fine motor development, he and his team have uh, demonstrated that this increased brain volume in typically developing children results in a better performance in terms of uh, motor mobility but in children with autism results in poor performance. So again, while we have these kinds of um, neurological functional uh, markers, they're not reliable enough to make diagnoses. So you can take an MRI and see increased brain volume, but you can't say that that's autism. So we need to do um, a behavioral diagnosis. And when we do behavioral diagnosis, there are inherent challenges in doing that. Uh, and among them are, as many of you probably know, differences in clinical judgment. Two clinicians can look at the same behavior and come up with two different clinical impressions. We have to ferret out a lot of times biases, and not intentional biases, but positive and negative biases sometimes in the parent, caregiver, and teacher report which many times is related to, I mean, it's a whole other set of literature, but related to stress in the environment and different other things like that. But we have to be able to understand that information and, and make good sense of it. And probably, I know for me, the most significant and largest fly in the woman, if you will, is variability. There's variability in the child's behavior from day to day, from morning to afternoon, and in some of these children from moment to moment. So the child that I see on Monday, if I see that same child on Friday, I am not likely to see the same child. Maybe close if I see him within a week, but it will not be the same child. Um, and, and, and this variability exists in, in an even larger way, I think, across settings. So a child who's seen by a pediatrician, for example, for 20 minutes in an environment that the child has associated with getting a needle, getting poked, getting prodded, is a very different child that I see in my office who I see all day, and there's no prodding, there's no poking. So we get things like anxiety and, and uh, things like that that come in and, and cause the child to present very differently. And so we come up with different diagnoses at times, observing those behaviors. And so we use this neuropsych assessment, this standardized approach to observing and quantifying behavior to smooth out some of that noise, to try to eliminate some of that variability. Um, and the primary tool, of course, that we're using to do this is the measures that we use have been norms, so they have been given to children of the same age and we are comparing the scores of the children we assess 
to the scores of this normed group and making some determination of where this present child score falls. And that helps us kind of smooth out, again, smooth out some of the noise and some of the variability. That being said, it's important to understand it doesn't get rid of it by any stretch of the imagination. There's even variability in the measures that we use. So while we often report one score to a parent, your know, child is in the low average range or this and that, what we're really saying, and we do this sometimes in our reports, I don't think we do it as often as we should, but really what we're saying underneath is, at the most, we are 95% confident that a score falls within a certain range. And beyond that, we're really not saying anything more specific than that. So variability doesn't go away. It's inherent, and as neuropsychologists, we're trained to deal with that variability and to make some sense of it, at least acknowledge it for sure. And so again, <coughs> autism and developmental dis uh, disorders um, are behavioral diagnoses. So you don't need a neuropsych assessment for diagnosis. Of autism. But again, it does provide useful information that you won't get just by observing the behavior. So again, we smoothed out some of that noise in terms of misinterpretations of behavior because we now bring in additional information to kind of make sense of what we're looking at. And it kind of, it really has a, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, helps us understand any given snapshot behavior that we may see. And you just need to be able to do that to make um, accurate descriptions of children. And the neuropsych assessment also brings into the picture that something that you don't get by simple observation is an understanding of the risk factors for a, a child. And depending, and no matter whether that child's low functioning or high functioning, all children, all people, all of us, have risk factors. So there are no perfect people. There are uh, blind spots, if you will, that the neuropsych assessment will get at and will be able to transmit that information to the adults in the child's world so that um, the kids can be compensated for and supported. So when we do our assessments, the, an important, a very critical and important part of it is the parent interview and to a lesser extent the child interview, depending upon the age and cognitive uh, level of the child. But the parent interview is, is, is just invaluable because a parent knows their child better than any psychologist will ever get to know them sitting in a room with them for one day. And so we need their information to help us make sense of the standardized assessment. So these numbers that we get, we need their information to help us understand those numbers. And a tool that we use in the moment to help us understand the numbers other than the parent and child interview is behavior observation. So we're trained in a systematic way of observing behavior. And in particular, how a child approaches a task. You can have, for example, you can two children can have the exact same score on the task, but those scores can have totally different meanings. And in Training and understanding that is just critically important. So for example, both two children get low average scores on the measure. One child has performed the task and that child had that child was distracted, impulsive, and maybe impulsive in a task avoiding kind of way. It's not unusual for us to have a child in our office who realizes that an adult is in charge, an adult has told them that they have to do a certain thing before they can leave. So the child decides, okay, adult, I'll do this certain thing so I can go. But not putting much effort, <coughs> not much thought, and whatever. So we have to be aware of that, which is vastly different from a child who has gotten that same low average score, but they pay attention, they were not impulsive, they understood exactly what was being asked of them because that's another weak area that another child would have. So we need to understand those things to interpret that those scores in totally different ways. And as neuropsychologists, we are trained in doing such. And so here at Clark, we do a number of different kinds of neuropsych assessment. And this is pretty much driven by the referral question. And the type of assessment drives 
our approach to that assessment. So it, it takes our protocol and that sort of thing. So we do baseline assessments, which are typically the child, a child's first assessment, and that would typically be a broader um, look at child's function because one of the things we want to be able to do is take that baseline assessment and use it to compare subsequent assessments too. Because as I will talk about more in a little bit, um, as scientists we are, we love patterns. So it's patterns of behavior that tells us more than any single snapshot of behavior can ever tell us. Uh, so the richness in understanding a child is in looking at their behavior over time. And so baseline kind of gets that started. And plan follow-up, of course, is child has been seen and has been recommended for further testing. So that dictates a different protocol based on information from those prior assessments. We focus in on what we need to focus in on to um, do that. And even more uh, tightly focused assessment, uh, the referral question is very specific. A child has XYZ problem, figure it out, let us know what we need to do. Again, tailors our protocol to that level. And we also do basic screens, which are quick and dirty, looks at, is there anything there we need to pay attention to or not? And so they'll tend to be shorter uh, uh, and quicker. And all of these assessments are done within uh, either a team or an independent type of concept. So obviously the independent assessment is the child is just seeing a neuropsychologist. And the team assessments that we do here a child is seen by a neuropsychologist, developmental pediatrician, uh, occupational therapist, and speech language pathologist. And even social work brings comes into bear on a lot of these teams assessment as well. Because we support these kids and families on a broad range of, of, of function. And, and now I think it's important to understand, so even if a child does come in under the rubric of an independent assessment, doesn't rule out them eventually morphing into a quasi-team assessment. Because certainly if the neuropsychologist sees that, uh, determines that more information would be helpful, then the child is referred to social work or to speech and language pathology or to developmental peace. And so they can wind up getting a team assessment regardless of how they came in, depending on what information. And, and so the referral question is generally, what's the diagnosis? And a description of functioning and recommendations. And so for me, and I think for a lot of neuropsychologists, while the diagnosis is important, I'm not a big fan of it, as you can probably tell by the squinty that on my face. So, the children need labels certainly to get services in school. They don't get services unless you get labels. Labels do help transfer the information across professionals to some extent. It gives other professionals some idea of what that child may look like. Beyond that, I personally have no use for them. Really. The, the more important, in fact, the single most important thing is the description of who that child is. Parents will often hear me tell them up front because I want to get them more focused on the description of their child than the diagnosis of their child. And I will often tell them, I really don't care what you call it at the end of the day, but let's understand who this child is so that we can understand what we need to do for that child. That's the important thing. And that's what the neuropsych assessment uniquely gets at a, a good thorough description of the child. Otherwise, people are just kind of, um, you know, throwing um, stuff up against the wall and hoping something sticks. But we can kind of refine what the child needs and how to go about it. And, and every child is different, as we know, every individual is different. And, and this not only helps parents and teachers, but it helps the medical um, end of it as well. Is, is, is medication something that may be appropriate or not appropriate for, or, or therapies, behavioral therapies, or whatever else kind of We delve into all of those kinds of things. And making recommendations is probably the second most important thing about what we do. So it's not only the description of the child, but it's in the recommendations that we, that we make as well. 
<clears throat> so just to quickly get us grounded so I can talk, we can talk more about um, neuropsychosexism as we relate to autism. So just quickly to review um, that autism is this quantity and severity of, system, of, of uh, symptoms in certain core areas. And as most of you know, we've had a recent reconfiguration, if you will, of the diagnosis in the new DSM. Um, pretty much everything is still there. It's just a slight reconfiguration of how we approach a diagnosis. But again, it, it's basically a disorder of social functioning and of behavior in terms of repetitive rigidness, uh, stereotypical type behaviors, and sensory processing issues. So these are the things we are basically still looking at. And so when it comes to neuropsych assessment, clarifying a diagnosis from a child is not an easy thing sometimes. So a lot of times your real question is, does the child have autism or not? And so we're, we're going to make that determination during the course of neuropsych assessment. And again, we're going to describe the child. We're going to describe in terms of their strengths and weaknesses and we're going to make recommendations. And, and this, this point I'm making at the end here about anticipating future difficulties relates to our training in terms of development. So as neuropsychologists, we are also trained in development. We, we have an understanding of how the brain develops, when certain skills, when you can expect certain skills to be present, when you should not be expecting them. We understand what underlying skills it takes that lead to a certain supernova, superordinate skill. So we can, we can look at a child at seven years old in a, in a weakness or a deficit in a certain area and not be present. But it's not necessarily not present because the child is not weak in that area. It's likely to be not present because there are no demands for that skill at that time. But we can anticipate that in two years, demand for that skill will be in place. And we can understand by what we see in terms of the child's current functioning, should we be anticipating problems for that child? And if we are, what recommendations and things do we need to put in place to make that child's life uh, as uh, beneficial for them as possible? And so specifically for parents when they come in, certainly parents want to know where their child is relative to other children. and. A lot of times we will get direct questions about what is my child's IQ um, in that round. And I guess, and so, and full scale IQ, let me, let me have full disclosure. Full scale IQ is another one of those things that I have very little use for, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess to some extent it's important to understand if a child's low average, if they're average, and this kind of thing. But again, the, the, the essence of the description is who the child is and what the child needs. And you can have, for example, you can have two children who have average IQs, but they can be totally different children. Because the average, that IQ is an average number. And it could have, and likely is made up of a different set of numbers that have been averaged. And so to know that the kid is average, yeah, okay, it's, it's one thing. But really what you what you really need to know is again who that child is. Is there a, what factors went into making that average. So that's it. so I try to move parents off of that as quickly as possible as well. Um, another important question is um, in terms of educational achievement, what we what you can use what you can tend to see a lot of times and have parents report is a child was doing fine in first grade, they were doing fine in second grade, starting to struggle a little bit in third grade. And so they're worried about what fourth grade is going to look like. Or they're in fourth grade and the bottom has fell out in fourth grade. And, and so they want to make sense of what's going on and prepare them for fourth grade coming up or seventh grade coming up. Again, this relates to development and demand in the school environment changing over time. And so it's not unusual to see kids, even without developmental disorders, do fine up until fourth grade, do fine up until seventh grade, seventh grade. But again, different demands kick in. And so we need to be prepared for that, for, for children. And 
one of the one of the more interesting questions I think that relates to, which I think is an important question that parents ask is, where is my child relative to where we should be expecting them to be? And um, I had a parent recently, very nice mom recently, um, when I posed the question, you know, why are you here? What question do you want to answer? She was very frank and she said, Dr. Jones, my my daughter is struggling in school and I want to know is she really having a problem or is she playing me? And after the assessment, the first, I addressed the question immediately and, it, and I told her, I said, you know, mom, your daughter's playing you. The child clearly had abilities that could be seen on neuroscience. So now that being said, it's, it's usually more, very much so more often the opposite, where the parent and or teachers suspect that a child is not putting forth their best effort because they're struggling in an area. And typically what the pattern that you will see is it's a bright child. They're doing very well in most things, but all of a sudden they're struggling in this. And so they must be moving on because we know they're bright. But generally that's not the case. For the most part it's not the case. Again, a neuropsych assessment can be that that because we are tapping into various different skills. And we understand the brain for the most part is, well, not for the most part, to some extent is compartmentalized into, in terms of, uh, uh, of function. So there are certain areas and neural networks that handle certain skills and others that do other skills, to, to some extent anyway. And you can have that kind of disparate functioning in the child, which is not clearly understood by the outside observer. And probably the most um, uh, heartfelt and certainly sensitive question comes as a child gets older and a parent is concerned about that child's ability to function when they're no longer around. And so they come to us to make a prediction about what their child can expect. Will they be able to be independent or not be independent? And we eventually do get at that. So, I, so how do we do our work? We collect data, observational data, standardized data from tests to come up with a clinical impression. What is it that we see? And we are trained in integrating different types of information to come up with that decision. And so one of the things we're looking at is, as I mentioned earlier, changes. We love patterns want to see, not want to see, but we're looking for changes over time, changes within the assessment. Uh, again, that, that, that not only the variability, but changes. So for example, if a child has had an assessment two years ago, we, we tap into the same skill today, do we see improvement? Do we see uh, steadiness in performance? What we see will tell us something if we see decreases. So we're looking at that comparison. For this one. And we're also considering um, the impact of the intervention in, in a number of different ways. And one way we're looking at that is, uh, for example, and again, we're, come, we're, we're working to come up with a clinical impression of a child. So we have two nine-year-old children. Both of them have difficulty with, with language processing. One of those children has had speech-language therapy for the past five years. The other child has only had six months of speech-language therapy. Two different clinical impressions because one has had much more intervention and opportunity to develop than the other child. So those similar scores mean totally different things. Um, and then we're also we're planning for current and, and future interventions as well. So we want to know, is what we're doing working? And if not, we need to change it to do something. And again, looking at scores will tell us that. And, and I think one of the important areas, and I think now start to get into more of the art of what we do. I mean, certainly the bulk of what we do is science. But I think part of the art is an appreciation for interfering behavior. And what I mean by interfering behaviors is um, some of the things that I mentioned earlier in terms of a child being 
avoidance in doing the task or not attentive in doing the task. We have to be able to consider those factors in order to interpret the scores appropriately. And, and sometimes it takes an art, it takes a little bit of an art to, to kind of get at that. There are some kids who are very good at seeming like they understood and every word you say it was not that and really they, they, they've not understood anything but again <clears throat> understanding how we do our work so we've got an information from the parent ah does the kid really understand no the kid will not like they understand what they want so we've got it from the parent or we we will attempt to get at it by using different measures to see if a child is really understanding or not but bottom line is we need to be aware <coughs> of the impact of these interfering behaviors on performance. Otherwise, we run a serious risk of coming up with an erroneous clinical impression of a child. Scores alone is not, I mean, and I think that's, that's one of the things anyway that separates neuropsychologists from anybody who can give a test. I mean, any of you guys can, can go buy a whisk or a waste and give it. And, and run it through the computer and present some scores. But that's not the same as a neuropsychological assessment. Uh, it's useful, don't get me wrong, but it's not, it's not the same. Thing. And so we've come up with our clinical impression and the really important, other important part of what we do is making the recommendations for, okay, now we know who the child is, what do we need to do to support this child? And as I talked a little bit about earlier, is the predictive the ability for us to do predictive recommendations that are really helpful to anticipate problems or weaknesses that a child may have coming down the road. So we want to get things in place now. We want to alert people that certain things will need to be in place later on uh, for this child as well. And and, I, and this curve, I think. Is, is a, this graph, anyway, I think is a nice um, uh, description of a couple of things I just want to point out real quickly. One is uh, all children learn. Uh, parents often come in and they really want to know, can my child learn, what will my child learn? All children will learn. If, if we do nothing, they will learn, they will develop. It's the, what separates a so-called typically developing child and a child with a developmental disability is generally the pace at which they learn. And so this top curve being the typically developing child, it's a steeper curve. But both children, groups of children, still learn. The other thing um, I think this graph points out that because of that different pace, as you see the gap between the lines are very small early on, but as time goes on, that gap does widen. Again, the, the, both sets of kids are learning. But this is part of the, the anticipation and the recommendation about future and things that we understand. The other thing quickly I want to point out is the bottom curve especially points out this uh, phenomenon I was speaking about earlier in terms of if, you, if we have some estimate here about where eight, year old, eight years is and, and we see a kind of height in the curve there, but then at nine we see a dip. And that is largely related to, again, different demands coming online for that child. And so while they were fine at eight, and just to report that they were fine at eight and have no anticipation for the difficulty that they're going to run across when they're nine, is, is, is <coughs> the neuropsychic assessment gets at that, and, and we're able to see that. And I think this curve really shows us that. And so we make these recommendations, and we make it for the child's world. And for me, it's, it's about the child world fit. The whole neuropsych assessment process is about the child world fit. So I'm clear to parents, and, and we're generally on the same page even before I say that, I just want to be clear that I am not about changing their child. Like this, is, this process is not about this. I'm about changing the child's environment, about teaching adults in their child's world how they need to change the child's environment so that child has an opportunity for maximum, um, to reach their maximum potential. All the responsibility is on the adults. It's not on, it's not on children. After we become adults, then okay, we'll take a little bit more responsibility. But adults are responsible for um, 
making an appropriate environment for children. And, and again, this is this is in all facets of the environment, including the medical docs for them to understand as well who this child is and what this child needs, um, and that sort of thing. And and one of the important points I want to point out here now, though, that uh, we don't do this based on one evaluation. Again, we love patterns. We love to be to see things over time. And so I, I would tell parents all the time that while the snapshot that I've gotten today is fairly valid, it's fairly accurate, the recommendations that I'm making are fairly secure, and it's kind of, but it's really over time when I'm going to become more and more confident in what I'm saying about this child and what predictions I'm making about this child. So it, over a course of two or three assessments, when now I've seen a certain pattern and there have been years of intervention involved in, involved in the child's life, then I'm very much more adamant about my description of that child than I am, than I was at that first assessment. And so we, we, we want to make sure that parents understand that and that we're not going to make that kind of lifelong prediction and one assessment. Not only that, but also because of this uh, stepwise developmental trajectory thing that we talked about earlier. Different skills are going to come online at different times. And so we can't make a prediction across the board at seven years old, about 12 years old. We need to see certain things develop and, and know that they're going to develop before we can make those kinds of things. So we're aware of all of this. And again, a neuropsych assessment makes those kinds of things fairly clear. So the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cloudy picture. And in our field here, in particular with autism, there are many other disorders that can mimic the look of autism. And this is typically why kids have come to us because the pediatrician or the parent or some other mental um, um, health care provider is not clear. It looks like autism, but not clear. So come to Kenny Krieger, the neuropsych assessment, the team evaluation will make sense of what it is. But any of these disorders, and there's many, there are many more, can look like autism, but is it really? And so to, to set up this, this case of Annette and a good example of the mimicry of the disorder. So when we look at autism, the feature of autism, just real quickly again, <coughs> socialization, failure to develop peer relationships, Lack of spontaneous seeking to share enjoyment, lack of social uh, reciprocity. In ADHD, what we are typically looking at is someone who's interrupting and intruding on others, talking excessively, difficulty playing quietly, not listening when they're spoken to directly, and has difficulty sustaining, uh, sustaining attention. Now, let's go back to the both of these things can present as autism. And I'll make that a little clearer in a minute. So this is a quick case vignette. So little Steve has been referred to us. And referred to us with diagnostic clarification. He's already, he, he comes in, someone has diagnosed him with autism, with PDD and autism. And the information we had before we see him, we have development history, language was pretty much typically uh, developed, some articulation difficulties. But Steve has trouble maintaining friendships, even though he engages in appropriate interactive um, and imaginative play. But he also has poor pragmatic skills. So he has difficulty with social boundaries, apparent difficulty with reading social cues, this sort of thing. And he has this hyper-focused interest in video games and television. And of course, he's hyperactive. Okay. So little six-year-old Stevie comes to the office, and eye contact is fine. He shakes the examiner's hand. But then he quickly falls to the floor and hides, which is more typical than you might imagine. Um, but he's also inquisitive. He's reciprocal, and he's conversational. And quite hyperactive and impulsive, and he lacks um, 
persistence in task, so it's difficult for Stevie to maintain his, his focus and, and to continue doing the task. So when we test, when we assess Stevie, we find that his cognitive skills are age appropriate for the most part, although he shows weaknesses in processing speed, basic auditory attention, and in this motor persistent thing, the ability just to stay in or something. And your formal uh, parent and teacher reports tells us that there are clinically significant um, concerns with inattention, hyperactivity, social interaction, and emotional control. So the question is, does Stevie have autism or not autism, or what does Stevie have? So now, it's likely that it's the trouble maintaining friendships in that initial description and the poor pragmatics they got him the autism diagnosis. But that is autism, to some extent, the social, the social piece of it. But, as here at CAR, being trained in autism, what Stevie did not have is lack of spontaneous seeking to share enjoyment or lack of social reciprocity. So Stevie is interested in interacting with other people. He just has problems doing it, but his problems are not rooted in um, um, lack of nonverbal socialization or ability to socialize. It's because he's impulsive. He's talking all the time. He's interrupting people. So he's going to have problems having friends, right? He can do that. The, the child of autism has problems having friends, but for two vastly different reasons. And it's this extensive evaluation that makes that determination in terms of um, what the, And so Stevie has felt that his problems are more rooted in a severe case of ADHD than it is in autism. Stevie is not a child who's on the autism spectrum by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so we make recommendations for medication consultation and for behavioral therapy. <coughs> and sure enough, Stevie responded well to these therapies which kind of supported the idea that it was, in fact, ADHD and not um, autism whatsoever. Has friends once he calmed down um, and stopped being so impulsive and talking to and, and everything turned out. And so, I mean, it would be nice if it would just be as complicated as, is it autism or is it something else? But most of the time, it's is it autism or autism and something else? And it takes a lot of, I think, expertise and detailed approach to gathering information to kind of make these, these decisions. And do we get it wrong sometimes? Yep. Sure we do. Because some of these cases are just extremely complicated. And again, which highlights again the importance of tracking children over time. So we make recommendations, we put some interventions in place. Are they working? We want to look to see in a year or two years. Are they working or not? If they're not working, then let's reassess what's going on here. And what's up. So a lot of times it's, it's, it's a very complicated business. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And I am certainly welcome. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh,